We gather to explore the eternal, nurture community and build a more just world. We gather to embody the beloved community. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are from, whatever your beliefs, life circumstances, or immigration status, you are welcome here. If you are new to Cedar Lane, we have a small gift for you. Please raise your hand, and if you are comfortable doing so, and keep it up for a moment so our ushers can find you. All are invited to stay after the service to enjoy coffee and conversation. If visitors choose to use a yellow mug, our members and friends will be sure to greet you. A special welcome to those joining our service online. Whether in the moment or catching the service afterwards, we are so glad you are worshiping with us this morning. In a moment, we will turn and greet our neighbors, uh, but before we do so, I'd like to draw your attention to the announcement page that is included as an insert in your order of celebration. There are many happenings here at Cedar Lane and around the community that I invite you to peruse and uh, be a part of, and I'm going to highlight just a few. First, our pastoral visitors work closely with the ministers to support the pastoral ministry of our congregation. If you have a pastoral need or concern, Betsy Bings, our pastoral care coordinator, will be available after the service in the library. Thank you, Betsy. And this Sunday we have the Super Sunday Auction, which is uh, specially created for all those who missed last Saturday's Falling for Cedar Lane Auction. So please stop by the lounge or the downstairs lobby after service to bid on a wide array of items, including Earth Trek climbing passes, children's books from three Cedar Lane authors, baseball training passes, theater tickets, and many, many more. Thank you for checking them out. Also coming up in early December is our annual favorite to kick off the holiday season, Holiday Craft Day, which will be happening on Saturday, December 2nd. It's an opportunity for members and friends and your neighbors to come together, people of all ages to make gifts and decorations like chocolates, gingerbread houses, wreaths, bird feeders, and I hear we'll be also doing some activist crafts. In the lounge after the service, also they're in need of some volunteers to head some of the crafts, so if you are a crafty person, please check it out. You have to get used to my bad puns. That's something I hid well before I was called. <laughs> also, next Sunday, November 19th, please consider bringing food items for the Mana Thanksgiving food drive. You may have received a flyer when you walked in. If not, pick one up to find out more about what kinds of items we are gathering to be able to deliver to Mana Food Center again this year. Also, next Sunday, uh, ongoing relief efforts in Puerto Rico. So I hope you will consider being generous supporters of both these important efforts next Sunday, when we will be welcoming former UUA moderator Ginny Von Korder to our pulpit. So we're looking forward. It'll be a, a special and big Sunday. Also next Sunday, please join the MoCo Pride Center and Maryland Trans Unity at the seventh annual Montgomery County Side, centering the experiences of trans women of color who continue to be targeted in our community, our nation, and the world. 
This afternoon at 1.30, I hope uh, we will join members of uh, Macedonia Baptist Church to support them in their struggle to stop the desecration of the historic Bethesda African burial ground. And if you think you didn't have enough during the day, you are welcome to gather back here at 7 p.m. for our first of many community forums that we will kick off. seeks to challenge damaging myths and stereotypes about immigrants and refugees and it's powerful it's already up so I hope uh, you'll be able to join us this evening which brings me to our share the plate offering this morning which is uh, supporting the family diversity They, they do traveling photo exhibits and books and curricula to help eliminate prejudice and stereotyping and harassment of people who are discriminated against due to their sexual orientation or gender or gender identity, race, national origin, religion and disabilities of all kinds. Thank you in advance for your generous support of this important work. And now, I invite you to just take a few moments to greet your immediate neighbor to your left, right, front, and back. Good morning. Good morning. Let us center ourselves, inviting our mind, body, and spirit into the space made sacred by our presence and the presence of the holy in which we live, move, breathe, and have our being. As we prepare for worship this morning, in May 2017, Cedar Lane and almost 700 UU congregations participated in a white supremacy teach-in to look critically within our faith communities for the ways racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and white supremacy live and intersect. Through introspe introspection, education, and public witness, our faith is coming to understand that countering white supremacy means both resisting its most blatant forms that are out there, but also disrupting its systemic manifestations within, in here. So continuing this work, we ask this morning, what does it mean to be a faithful people to counter, disrupt, and dismantle white supremacy and dare to embody beloved community? With that intention, let us worship.
we can dare to face ourselves in our entirety, to understand our pain, to feel the tears, to listen to our frustration and confusion, and to discover new capacities and capabilities that will empower and transform us. As Mamohao Chwaedi comes forward to kindle our chalice, symbol of our shared faith, please rise in body and or in spirit to share the chalice lighting words printed in our order of service. With, With humility, humility and courage, courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. Please remain as you are to sing There's a River Flowing in My Soul, written by Rose Sanders, a prominent civil rights activist, attorney, and the first woman in, of African descent to become a judge in Alabama. My friends, it is the spiritual practice of this community to create a space each Sunday morning in which we bear witness to the joys and sorrows that unfold in our lives. It is a time when we name ourselves each other's companions on journeys of faith, both individual and communal, both sustaining and challenging. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life and of love, God of many names, God beyond naming, we gather this morning to open our hearts and minds to all that lifts us up and to all that challenges us. We gather to offer solace to each other and to open ourselves to the comfort that is offered. 
We gather to reach out in welcome, to look forward in hope, and to recognize the opportunities for joy. Spirit of life and of love, we hold in our hearts this morning those for whom parenting is a primary, difficult, and joyful spiritual practice. We hold in our hearts those who live with grief, with chronic pain, with illnesses seen and unseen, with mental illness or addiction. We hold in our hearts those who care for their friends and family. Our hearts fill with love for those who have departed before us and for those left behind in grief. We lift up this morning the memory of Patricia Phillips' mother, Marilyn, who died last Tuesday. Spirit of life and of love, this weekend in particular we offer our deepest gratitude to all who serve and have served in the Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, Navy, and Marines, whatever their role and wherever their service has or will take them. And finally, we ask for strength and insight on our shared journeys of faith, journeys that include passages that are often deeply challenging as we look within, having the courage to recognize all that we have yet to learn and all that we have to offer. May we and our fellow travelers on this journey, our friends and companions in this world, be held in the embrace of prayer and silence. Amen. During the silence that follows, we ask all to rise as we commemorate the many losses suffered in recent days, in particular, the tragic loss of life at First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas. Please stand in body and or in spirit and let us enter that silence together. Amen. Oh. 
There's nothing quite like having a breakdown on a train. So we've all seen that person on a train desperately trying to hide their uncontrollable tears. Well, in late April, that was me. I could not stop crying for three hours on the train ride from Boston to New Jersey after the April UUA board meeting. So I, of course, tried to hide that I was crying from my seatmate in order to maintain appropriate train ride decorum because I really did not want to be that person. So what caused this breakdown? This was just after the April UUA board meeting. Now, I'm proud to serve as a trustee of our UUA, but it has not been easy since late March when the controversy over hiring practices erupted that led to the first ever resignation of a UUA president and sparked a national discussion about a culture of white supremacy in our association and in our faith. And as a UUA trustee, I was one of the oh-so-lucky few at the epicenter of the controversy and tasked with helping to fix it. So it might come as no surprise that after that in-person board meeting, in the middle of this period of heightened stress, I would find the need to cry to relieve some of it. But that actually wasn't the main reason for the tears. The main reason was that I was having a spiritual crisis over perfectionism. For the first time in my life, I was being live tweeted as I talked. The UU World, our denominational magazine, was there live tweeting the board meeting. Oh, hundreds of folks were watching the UUA board meeting streaming live. We would literally see quotes of ours from minutes prior show up as Facebook memes. It was surreal. In this period of heightened stress and anxiety in our denomination, I believe that I would do real harm to the health of our association if I were to misspeak because that imperfect thought could go viral before I had a chance to refine what I said. It triggered every perfectionist streak in me, and it was awful. It was awful. Now, part of the reason that it was awful was that just two weeks prior, I had read a document, the same document that you picked up on the way in, about how white supremacy shows up in institutions. And first on the list, perfectionism. It's the very first characteristic of how white supremacy shows up in organizations. The feeling of and expectations of perfectionism. So I felt like I was in a catch-22. I needed to dismantle perfectionism to help dismantle white supremacy in our UUA, but I was actively needing to be a perfectionist. So during that crisis on the train ride home, it's when it finally clicked for me. What people are talking about when they talk about this culture of white supremacy, and how even as a big white guy, this culture of white supremacy can hurt me too. That perfectionism I felt stifling me is just a small portion of what our colleagues and family of color deal with every day in our broader culture of white supremacy. 
So fellow white folks, and know this is not easy to hear. As a big white guy who's also super liberal and progressive, who grew up in South Georgia where nearby counties still had segregated proms, the first time I heard that I am somehow part of this white supremacy culture, well, I thought back to the people in my hometown with their pickup trucks and Confederate flags, and it, all, it set off all these defensive triggers in me. I thought, those are the white supremacists, not me. Those people in Charlottesville, not me. But something I try to do in life is when I notice myself getting defensive, I try to examine what's really causing that defensiveness. As my colleague Asia Hauser says, when you notice you're getting defensive, get curious instead. And then I really listened to what people were saying, not what I had assumed they were calling me. Fellow white folks, saying that we're part of a culture of white supremacy and contribute to it is not the same thing as saying we're this, one of those people marching on Charlottesville. So I used to think how much I hated a waspy culture. What's the W stand for in WASP? It stands for white. I realized that the WASP culture I had always thought about and hated was the same white culture others were talking about, and that's when it finally clicked for me. This culture that we white folk are used to operating under and feel safe under because we know the rules, even though we can hate it at times, is the same culture that actively harms our siblings of color and harms us as white folk too. So if we work to eliminate this culture of white supremacy, I can only imagine how liberated each and every single one of us would feel. It sounds like that dream folks talk about when they talk about the dream of beloved community. It sounds like a place I want to be. And most importantly, it sounds like our true faith. Thank you. Please join me in singing the first verse to There's a River in My Soul. Thank you. I grew up in Kenya, which happened to have been a British colony. When I first went to school and I said my name was Wangari, I realized that the other little girls had names like Elizabeth and Mary, and they looked at me curiously. The other compliment that was the highest to receive in this environment was, you speak English without an accent. You speak English almost like a British person. As time went, fast forward, as a professional, I hear, you are so articulate. When I was younger, going back to Kenya, I went back home one day and I said to my father, why don't I have a Christian name? And my father responded, well, because you're the firstborn girl in this family and you are named after my mother, Wangari. In addition, Wangari was one of the nine daughters of Gekoyo and Mombi, the originators of the Kikuyu ethnic group. My father was also a traditionalist. He straddled two cultures with ease. I went to school and I read Shakespeare. And during the school holidays, I read Ngogewa Thiongo and I read Ogot Bibitek. I didn't realize then the importance of this cultural grounding. Because as I traveled the globe in Europe and finally here in the United States, 
I have had to draw on this strength many times. I remember requesting a meeting in my professional environment to discuss on career development with a human resources officer. Before the meeting even started, before I could even sit down, the person said, most of the jobs require an undergraduate degree. And I nodded. And once I sat down, I asked, are there any jobs that require a master's degree? And the penny dropped, as the British would say. The implicit bias was, of course, I did not have a master's degree. I then have realized that sometimes there are rules and criteria that are dusted, that are obscure, and sometimes applied when somebody who looks like me walks into a room. Here at Cedar Lane, in my spiritual home, I have witnessed an incident where maybe the rules were dusted, Maybe the criteria needs to be re-examined. It needs to be rewritten. It was written by people just like us. If we want to be inclusive, we need to examine a few things to here. The one thing I am most proud of is that we are dialoguing here. We are talking about white supremacy and what we can do as members of this community, this beloved community. Going back to my professional life, there are times when I hear, well, to be promoted to the next level, you need to do this job for at least a year or two so we are sure that you can do this job. And if there is an opening at the higher level, you will be considered for promotion. At the same time, I see people who do not look like me being promoted on potential. This person has the ability to do this job. It is really incredible when you see things like this happen. And the fact that we are dialoguing here is a great comfort to me because I don't know if we will ever dialogue there. One of my greatest mentors Wangari Madai was the first woman in East Africa to receive a PhD. She was the first woman on the African continent, a continent of 53 countries, to receive a Nobel Prize. But I need to step back from that and ask, is it internalized oppression on my part? That is, that is what I realize first about my greatest mentor. I think it should be her ability to connect, her empathy, that she could transcend and speak to climate change experts in Switzerland, in the United States, in Paris. And she could turn around and remove her gumboots and go barefoot and help women in Kenya at the grassroots in villages dig holes to plant trees so that the watersheds could return, so that these women could grow food to feed their families. I think that is the criteria I should apply when I think of my mentor. Thank you. And now I invite you to sing verse number two. There is a river flowing in my heart.
A couple of weeks ago, I spent time at the African American Museum of History and Culture. And I was rocked and moved by the story that it tells. If you haven't been to the museum, the exhibits begin three levels underground, starting first with enslavement and moving forward in time as one ascends towards the ground level. Now, the journey upward is a metaphor for the difficult path toward freedom from enslavement and then toward our current and continuing challenges and problems. Now, the exhibits honestly and directly and openly tell the story of the brutality of slavery and the aborted promises of abolition, the withdrawal from the work of reconstruction, Jim Crow and its contemporary embodiment, the terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan and lynchings, the succession, I'm sorry, the success of the exceptional few following the civil rights struggles of half a century ago, and above all else, the reality of the culture of white supremacy on which this nation was both founded and continues to operate. White supremacy culture is on the ascendance right now in our nation and around the world with one of the richest older white men in our highest office, surrounded by other richest older white men who subscribe to white nationalist ideas. But white supremacy culture is not about individual prejudice alone because it does not care about whether white people are racist or anti-racist, whether they are wealthy or poor, although it does have a clear preference for rich white people and a clear disdain for poor working whites. White supremacy is a force much larger than any overt or blatant act of racially motivated hatred. It's deeply embedded into our personal attitudes and behaviors, our cultures, and our institutions that we cannot often see. The culture of white supremacy is not just about race. It includes structures of privilege for men over women, straight over queer, cisgender over transgender, able-bodied over those with physical limitations, citizens over immigrants. It is the culture in which we live, move, breathe, and work. And each oppression has a designated place in that culture. And that culture presses down on people with various identities in different ways, but it presses down on all of us, no exceptions, including those who are white and straight and cisgender male. Now, this culture of white supremacy exists not only out in the world, out there, but also in how we structure our congregations and our institutions in here. It is, in the Reverend Bill Sinkford's words, about the pattern and practice of our faith, the ruts of outcomes that we accept as normal and natural. Now, I know it is hard for us good liberal Unitarian Universalists to hear that we too are somehow implicated in this system of white supremacy. I felt it too. Some of us are angry at other liberal white UUs for not being engaged enough about systemic racism. Some are angry at those conservative whites for being the real racists, the tiki torch carrying types. And some are angry at people of color and their anti-racist white allies for daring to bring up white supremacy and forcing us to talk about it. So people in our faith movement are angry at one another. Now, many of us have been taught under this culture of white supremacy to see anger and conflict as signs of failure, instead of seeing them as signs of honesty, as ways of dealing with the real problems and differences of our lives. 
What kind of community are we seeking to build? What kind of relationships are we seeking to have if it is not safe enough to disagree and struggle with each other, to sit with the discomfort and find a way to reconcile and renew our commitment to build the beloved community? What does it say about us? Unitarian Universalist Leila Ibrahim reminds us of the why of church. She writes, we are in church to learn to love better. We disagree, we annoy, we flake out on one another. And we worship, we support, we hold, and we affirm one another. This is really only one choice between imperfect community and no community. Again and again, we are all called to choose to commit ourselves to building a more just, more diverse, and yet ever messy and imperfect beloved community. So the conversation about white supremacy both within and without is an important one to have. But in order to do it, we need to be able to notice, to pay attention, to ask questions that the culture of white privilege and white supremacy would never have us ask. Noticing is the first challenge for most of us who identify as white, though that may not be the challenge for those of us who identify as people of color. See, in the past few months, I've had many conversations with Unitarian Universalists, both white and people of color. While many white UUs have raised all kinds of questions and concerns about the language of white supremacy, most people of color understood it. Now, some of the people of color would rather we not use the phrase and object to it on strategic grounds. But all people of color understand it because we've been swimming against it all our lives. The second thing is we need to find ways to bring the voices and presence of persons of color in from the margins toward the center of our faith, to make more room in the center because the center of our faith has the capacity to hold everyone. It is not an either-or proposition where when people of color step in, white people have to leave. No, we can be situated in the center together. That will change the conversation and challenge some of our comfortable theological, sociological, and cultural assumptions. And we need to cultivate the ability to hear one another, to listen to one another more deeply than be deafened by our own anger or guilt or defensiveness. And as Tim said, quoting Asia Hauser, when we do feel that, to be able to get into a place of holy curiosity rather than walk away because we feel hurt or angry or defensive. Part of our collective work is knowing where we have been so that we can effectively choose the direction for our future. And my friends, this is a time of opportunity for all of us, a time when we can redeem some of our history and chart a course forward. We can do this if we stay present to one another, if we learn how to lean into our discomfort together, if we stay honest with each other, if we begin to notice, if we make more room, if we hear one another and if we stay together. Relationship 
is the sandpaper that wears away our resistance to change. Relationship is the abrasion that agitates enough to make a way forward. Relationship, consistent and ongoing encounter with people and perspectives different than our own. It smooths the way for the sacred, even as it rubs us raw. the ushers to come forward to give and receive 
an offering to sustain the mission and ministry of Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church and the work of the Family Diversity Projects. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. So as you heard today, we are doing our second teaching on white supremacy. And the focus this time is on how white supremacy shows up in institutions. So you got a handout as you walked in. You got a couple of handouts as you walked in today. One has definitions of common terms, which we're quizzing you on in five minutes. And... So we're going to use that handout on white supremacy in institutions for the, this next part. It's the uh, white pages stapled together. So this next portion of the service, you're going to form yourselves into small groups. Yes, you can move the chairs around if you need to. Let's try to put them back when you're done. In these small groups, you will discuss the answers to a couple of different questions. We will discuss the first question for probably about five-ish minutes then have a musical break, and then discuss the second question for about five more minutes. If you're a person of color who would prefer to talk with other people of color, I invite you to caucus together around these same questions if you so choose. Head over to the area by the name tags if you want to be in the people of color centered group. In your groups, spend about a minute in silence as you consider the question. Some folks, like myself, need a little time to consider the question before replying and then go around the group and each person can share their thoughts. Please be respectful of each other. Today we are all in a place of learning. Practice the art of deep listening while others are sharing. So to ground our discussion, I invite Reverend Avi up to lead us in saying the newly passed Congregational Covenant out loud together. Thank you, Tim. I invite us to read together the Covenant of Right Relations that we endorsed enthusiastically a couple of weeks ago at our congregational meeting. We yeah. of Cedar Lane...
people and openly ask for help when we need it. Forgive ourselves and others when we fall short and begin again in love. To live this covenant as a congregation, I promise to embody these aspirations to the best of my ability in all my interactions with and for this, our beloved community. Thank you. And now we invite you to form small groups of two, three, four, or five, more helpfully with people you don't know or don't share a home with, <laughs> and uh, talk amongst yourselves. So we're going to focus on this question. So our That's first, up on screen. So our first question for discussion. Look through the list of characteristics of white supremacy in institutions. Which of these characteristics have you noticed in your own life? Which have you internalized? Which of these show up in your workplace? So take about five or so minutes to chat as a group. I'll handle it. Thank you, sir. That's nice. Are you a one-horned person? Are you a one-horned person?
Please take a couple more minutes to discuss this and then we'll move to the next question. Friends, let's pause and return and bring ourselves back just for a moment. Well, I'm getting a message here. <laughs> it's always a risk asking you used to talk amongst themselves. Invite us to look at the second question. Which of these characteristics have you noticed here at Cedar Lane UU Church? What can you do to help stop those characteristics when you notice them? Hmm. Go for it.
Give yourselves a couple more minutes. Well, I hate to put a damper on what's sounding like a very engaged, energetic congregational discussion, but I invite us to return. And please rise in body, endure, and spirit to sing, Love Will Guide Us. Please remain as you are and as you feel moved, hold hands with your neighbor or bump elbows. Today is just the beginning in having these kinds of engaged conversations and to go deeper in an invitational way so we are able to support one another as we have some difficult and loving conversations about issues that impact all of us, impact some of us, and work the work of being the beloved community. So in that spirit, I'll offer you these words from my good colleague, the Reverend Marta Valentin. Spirit of the circle that is love, as we twirl in this dance that is life, we give thanks for reminding us each day of our task of ministering to each other with a searching glance, a safe touch, a generous smile, a thoughtful word. Thank you for reminding us that we are always building our beloved communidad. Thank you for reminding us that through our covenant with you, we covenant with each other and are made whole. Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu 
शातेर्भवतु पूर्ण मंगल ओ शाति 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 ओ शाति 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 ओ शाति 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 The worship is done, the service begins. With gratitude and appreciation to Romero Wyatt and friends who will lead us out with an awesome drumming postlude that we are all invited to participate in. So we have